Come on, Lacey. Listen, if, uh, if you know Lacey, you love Lacey. And uh, yeah, and if you don't know Lacey, you should get to know Lacey because you will love Lacey. Uh, she does such a great job on our team. And, and I'll just take a moment to brag on all the young female leaders on our staff. We have many of them, and they truly are some of the most gifted leaders I have ever been around. Just killing it, leading out in extraordinary ways. And uh, as a church, we are blessed to have many of them serving with us. Lacey's one of them. So if you see her around, just encourage her. Um, thank her. I was going to have her make a speech today, which she would love, but she's not here. So she skipped out. Didn't want to see herself on video. But hey, uh, welcome again to church. Great to see all of you. And I and, uh, want to say a special welcome as well to everyone joining us across all of our campuses. Uh, before we dive into the word, I, I wanted to take a moment to celebrate a win and many of you contributed to this, and you don't even know you did it, so I want to make sure you know about it, okay? Uh, I don't know if you realize this, but in our local community, uh, teen anxiety and depression is at an all-time high, like it is in many communities. Uh, in fact, in, in one of our local Bartow County schools just last year, 10% of the student population either attempted to take their own life or expressed suicidal thoughts and ideologies, which is absolutely heartbreaking. That is a big, big number. And so we've been talking with school administrators about what we can do to help and ways that we as a church can serve. And so what we did about a week ago is we brought in an organization called Curate Hope. And they actually do school assemblies and they bring hope to teachers and students dealing with anxiety and depression. And so we actually brought them in and they went to three local schools, Adairsville Middle School, Cartersville Middle School, and Cartersville High School. They did eight assemblies spoke to over 3,000 students, and then they came here to our Cartersville location, and they did a parent workshop. We captured that on video, and we're going to be pushing that teaching content out to over 2,500 caregivers. Okay, listen, as a guy who cares deeply about the next generation, I want to say thank you, because all of you who give to Crosspoint faithfully week in and week out, you paid for that. Like, you made this possible. We were able to bring them in because of you. And so I, I love being a part of such a generous church. Like when we give, this is the kind of stuff we get to do. We get to bless our community, partner with our school systems. And so again, I just wanna say thank you and, and be in prayer with me. Um, I am trusting and believing that God's gonna use what happened in all of these schools to really impact and affect change, not only in the lives of students, but teachers and families. And so as we hear stories along the way, I'll be sure to share those, all right? All right, well, hey, if you have a Bible, let's grab them. And we're heading back to the book of Hebrews today. We're in Week 13 of a 21-week series. It's going to take us all the way till Christmas. So here's yet another reminder. You have eight weeks left to get ready for Christmas, okay? <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. Some of you are very nervous now, right? Eight weeks, so get to shopping. But uh, if you have your journal, you can grab it as well. You can go to page 56. That's where you'll find the text and all the note pages for today. But just two weeks ago, I introduced the concept of a covenant, in the ancient world, a covenant was a legally binding contract between two parties, often confirmed by an oath. And the best example of this we have in our current culture is marriage. Okay, in marriage, a man and a woman enter into a legally binding contract, and it is often confirmed by an oath. There's a wedding ceremony, right? These people go to a really overpriced venue somewhere, and they stand up and very, very expensive clothes, and they make vows and commitments to one another before a crowd of witnesses, and then they seal those commitments with the giving and receiving of rings. And what they're doing in this moment is they're entering into a covenant relationship. Well, when you look back throughout history and you study the Bible, you actually see God doing a very similar thing with various people. Uh, he entered into a covenant with Noah to never again flood the earth, and then he sealed that covenant with a sign called a rainbow. Uh, as we've learned over the last couple of weeks, he entered into a covenant with a guy named Abraham, uh, told him he was going to bless him, make his name great, make him the father of a great nation. He was going to use him to bless all the families of the earth. Uh, he entered into a covenant with a guy named David. This was King David, the most famous king in Israel's history, to one day through his lineage send a king into the world to reestablish his eternal rule and reign over his people. That was Jesus, by the way. And then he established another covenant with a nation called Israel. 
And he did this through the prophet Moses, which is why it's often called the Mosaic Covenant, also known as the Old Covenant. And we're going to talk about the details of that covenant today. But what God was doing, in essence, is he was entering into a marriage relationship with these people. Now, what's unfortunate is that when you go and read the Old Testament, you find these people running out the door and committing spiritual adultery. Okay, God took the people to himself, and the people agreed to take God as their God, and then they went out and they started sleeping with other gods. Uh, They were like the unfaithful spouse, sleeping around on the very faithful spouse. In fact, there's a book in your Bible that illustrates the relationship between God and Israel. It's called Hosea. You should read it. It's a fascinating book. But God told this guy, he's like, hey, I want you to marry a prostitute. God, why would I do that? Because I want Israel to know what it's like to be married to her. That's why. I'm faithful. She's not. Yet, instead of quitting the marriage and running out the door, here's what's amazing. God remained committed. So committed, in fact, that in Jeremiah 31, which was some of your homework last week, hopefully some of you remember to read that, but in Jeremiah 31, God told these unfaithful people, I'm going to form a new covenant with you. This is going to be a new covenant, it's going to be a better covenant, and this is the covenant we're going to talk about in our time together today. And so, if you're already there, Hebrews 8, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Here's what the other writes. Now, the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was was about to erect the tent, He was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And we'll stop there and talk because there's a lot to unpack, okay? Uh, If you've been here for the last several weeks, you know that we have been talking primarily about the priesthood of Jesus. Ever since the end of Hebrews 4, uh, that's been what the author has described and explained. The current ministry of Jesus, his eternal priesthood. And I love it. He opens up chapter 8 by saying, if you've missed the point, let me remake the point. Here's the point. Jesus is the greater priest. Okay, his priesthood is greater and better than the Old Testament priesthood. And he reiterates that point by pointing us once again to Jesus' current location. Uh, Some of this is going to be repetitive, but apparently the author thought it was so important that he needed to repeat himself. And so I'm just going to repeat myself again today, all right? Let me point some things out. Where is Jesus? Well, number one, he's seated. Jesus, right now, as you are seated in your chair, is seated, okay? Okay? Uh, When I was in high school, I used to work in the restaurant industry, worked at a seafood restaurant. It was horrible, like the worst job I ever had. And then I worked at a pizza restaurant. It was a lot better. It was much more fun than the seafood restaurant. And then when I got into college and even out of college, I did retail for a while, worked in retail management. And if you've ever worked in either of those industries, you know you never sit down, ever, because there's always something to do, right? Right? There's someone to serve, there's a table to clean, there's a drink to refill, um, there's clothes that need to be folded and put away. Well, the same was true for the priests in ancient Israel. When they were in the temple doing they, their service, they never sat down. There was always another ritual to perform, a sacrifice to offer, uh, a, a gift to make. And so this work was perpetual, it was ongoing. Here's what's interesting about Jesus. When he came here 2,000 years ago, And he sacrificed himself on the cross in our place for our sins, resurrected from the dead, and then ascended back to heaven. What did he do? He he sat down. Why? Because all the work to save sinners like you and me had been accomplished. There was nothing left to do. The author goes on and tells us that Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. That he is seated at the Father's right hand. In the ancient world, kings would often surround themselves with very powerful nobles or powerful aristocrats. And when they would come together in the royal court, the person sitting to the right of the king, it was always the most powerful and prestigious person in the room. The author of Hebrews is saying that's where Jesus is. Like God the Father is on his throne in heaven and Jesus Christ is in his resurrected glorified body sitting at his right hand in a position of honor, in a position of authority and power. And then finally, Jesus is in the true tent. He's in the true tent. This is not a tent that the Lord set up, or that man set up, excuse me. This is a a tent that the Lord set up. 
And with this language, the author is taking us back yet again to the Old Testament, second book of the Bible, Exodus chapters 25 through 27, where God gave Moses instructions to build a tent. Uh, This particular tent was called the tabernacle. And we read in verse five, God told him, you need to build it according to the pattern that I gave you on the mountain. Okay, this is so interesting. Here's Moses on Mount Sinai receiving all of these instructions from God, and it is believed that God showed him a model of the tent. See, the word pattern there in the Hebrew implies more than verbal instruction. And I'll just admit, I have no idea how this worked. I don't know if Moses saw a vision or if God literally dropped a model in front of him, like supernaturally. Uh, There is an old Jewish belief that the angel Gabriel actually descended in a workman's apron, like showed up Home Depot style, right, and an apron like that. And he brought furniture with him. And he literally showed Moses how to build all the furniture that needed to go into the tent or the tabernacle. I have no idea if any of that's true or not. We just know God gave the brother some instructions. And he showed him how to build it. And here was the instruction, make a mobile structure. Because at this point in Israel's history, they were somewhere between Egypt and the promised land. Journey was supposed to take about a year, and because they were mobile, this place needed to be mobile. I want you to build something that you can take down and that you can set up. And God said, when it's set up, that's where I'm going to come and meet with you. Okay, quick aside. I want to just speak to all of our campuses for a moment out there, Rome and Adairsville. Uh, Mobile church, hopefully this encourages you, is biblical. Isn't that awesome? Uh, uh, Tear down and set up church, it's biblical. And what I love is this. The presence of God is not contained to permanent spaces. Like God can show up and meet with anyone, anywhere, anytime. He can meet you in that school cafeteria. He can meet you in that other church building. And so we can't ever believe that God can only show up in a space like this where we are in Cartersville. No, I'm trusted and believing that God's going to use those mobile spaces in those other cities to change lives and to do work that only he can do. Amen? Amen. And so we see this earthly tent, this mobile structure, and this is where the priests served. Uh, When it was set up, they would come in and they would offer gifts and they would offer sacrifices. And the language in verse 5 is so important. Okay, we're told that they served a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. And I want to try to illustrate this. If I went to the back of our building here in Cartersville, we have a, a room called the resource room. It's where we keep our copier. And I copied my hand and I gave that to you. You would see my hand, but it wouldn't really be my hand. Like it would be the thing, but it wouldn't be the real thing. Are you tracking with my logic? Um, That's what a copy does. It it represents a greater reality. The same is true of a shadow. Uh, I was in my bedroom the other night helping to feed our newborn baby girl. Y'all pray for her. She's wearing us out. We really need her to sleep. So (laughs) just if you remember, just pray, okay? Um, But I'm sitting on the bed. I'm helping to feed her. All the lights were out, but I had the flashlight on on my phone so I could see just a little bit. And so I look over at one point, and our shadow's on the wall. And so I'm looking at us. Like, that was us, but it wasn't really us. Like, we were sitting on the bed, and, and so the shadow was representing a greater reality. This is the point. Okay, everything that the priests did in ancient Israel, it was a copy, it was a shadow, it was a thing, but it wasn't the real thing. What they did represented a greater reality, and that greater reality is Christ. You see, every sacrifice pointed to his ultimate sacrifice. Every offering pointed to his offering. Even the priests themselves pointed to his priesthood. Everything they did. God was just using them to get us ready for him. And so the simple point the author's making is this. Jesus, he's not in an earthly tent. He's not. And and he even says if he were on earth right now, he wouldn't be in an earthly tent because Jesus wouldn't be a priest. I talked about this last week, but Jesus came from the wrong tribe. All the priests came from the tribe of, if you remember, of Levi. Uh, Jesus didn't come from that tribe. He came from the tribe of Judah, which was the kingly tribe in the nation of Israel. This is why Jesus never attempted to enter the Holy of Holies. I mean, he could have gone in there if he wanted to. He owned the place. It was his. But he never once attempted to go in. Um, Instead, when he was here on earth, he functioned much like a prophet. Uh, A prophet is someone who speaks for God and of God, and this is what Christ did because he is God. He's the son of God. Uh, John 1, he's the logos, the divine self-expression or speech. What that means simply is that if you're someone trying to figure out who God is, all you need to do is look to Jesus. He speaks of God because he is God incarnate. But I would also argue that in many ways Jesus functioned as king. 
Like he showed up and he just started putting things back in order, which is what kings do. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast out demons, he calmed storms, he fed thousands of people with a little boy's lunchable, just amazing stuff. And he even called people to follow him. Think about that audacity. I want you to leave everything behind and I want you to come and follow me. You don't ask someone to do that unless you believe you possess a great kingly authority, right? But today, think about it, today, here's Jesus right now in present time, seated in his glorified body at the right hand of God the Father in the true tent, the heavenly places, and he's ministering and he's serving as our high priest. I was thinking about it just this past week, um, John 13. This is a text that we've talked about in our church a lot over the last couple of years. It's the famous story of Jesus the night before his crucifixion washing his disciples' feet. They were gathered for the Passover meal in a borrowed room and that meant there was no servant there to do this disgusting job and, and this job was often reserved for the lowest servant in a household. None of the other disciples wanted to do it. I don't get on the floor and wash the gross feet of all these nasty men, right? And so they sat through dinner with gross feet. And then at some point, they all started fighting about which of them was the greatest. And during the fight, Jesus gets up and he grabs a basin and he fills it with water and he gets a towel and he comes back and gets on the floor, assumes the position of the lowliest servant in the home and he just starts washing feet. Okay, here's what struck me this past week. Jesus is doing that same ministry for you and me today. He's on his throne in heaven right now and he's continuing to wash the feet of sinners like you and me, praying for us, defending us before God the Father, representing us to him, giving us grace and mercy to help us in our times of need. And it's in light of this that the author goes on in verse six, and, and here's what he writes next. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. We're gonna talk about those promises in a few moments. But he goes on and says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, and this is where he starts quoting Jeremiah 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. And so it's in these few verses where the author tells us why a new covenant is needed. Like, why won't the old one just work? Why do we need a new one? Why do we need a better one? Well, under the old covenant, uh, there were three things that God gave primarily. The law, the sacrificial system, and the priesthood. And so first, he gave his people 613 laws. I'm gonna save you out of Egyptian slavery. I'm gonna bring you into a land of promise. I want you, my nation, to be a light to all the other nations, and so therefore you have to live differently. And so God gave them 613 laws and commands. This is how I want you to live. And there were promises of blessing and cursing attached to the laws. Uh, you can read about this in Deuteronomy 28, but God told his people, if you follow the law, I'm gonna bless you. Everything and everyone will be fertile. There will be crops and kids everywhere. Life will be awesome for you. On the other hand, if you don't follow the law, uh, it's gonna be cursing, it's gonna be chaos, it's gonna be calamity, drought, famine, your enemies are gonna come in and take you out and take you over. Uh, life's not gonna go so well. Well, in addition, God gave the sacrificial system because he knew these people aren't gonna follow the law perfectly. They're sinners, okay? And so the provision was this. When you sin, you can kill an animal in your place, shed its blood, and that will provide atonement for you. It'll put you back in right relationship with me. And then finally, the priesthood was there to mediate all this. Uh, they were there to make sure that these sinful people didn't approach God on their own terms. And so they were the mediators. They were the intercessors. Well, here's what the author says. That old covenant, it was faulty. Not because it was broken, but because it was incomplete. Not finished, limited in certain ways. It'd be like you, if you were building a car, putting a half-finished engine into that car. Like, you could do that, but that car ain't going anywhere, right? The problem is, um, the engine isn't finished. It's not complete. It's not that it's broken. You just need to finish it out. In the same way, the old covenant was incomplete. You see, it did everything that it was designed to do. Uh, the law revealed sin. 
Like this book, it's a mirror. It's why when you read it, you're brought to terms with how jacked up you are. Wow, that's me. Yeah, I see me in there. Um, the law also points us to our need for a savior. I'm not perfect. I fall short. I can't save me. I need someone outside of me to do that for me. The sacrificial system ultimately revealed the need for a once and for all sacrifice. Like, can you imagine coming to church every week? You got to bring an animal with you to kill. Been a bad week. I brought a few, right? Like, can you? <laughs> can you imagine that? But, but this was the temple. Like when you showed up to the temple, it was basically a butcher shop and the priests were the butchers. There were carcasses everywhere, the smell of blood and dead flesh everywhere, fires burning, sacrifices being consumed. And so when you showed up to church back in the day, you, you were reminded week in and week out, somebody's gotta come and do something about this. Like we can't keep making sacrifices like this forever. And then every time you looked at that priest who was also a weak man, Broken, sinful, like you were reminded, we need someone perfect to come to truly represent us to God in the right way. The old covenant did everything it was designed to do, but that's all it could do. It couldn't save, it couldn't perfect, it couldn't put sinners in right relationship with God. Now, in addition, the author says that this faulty covenant, it came to a faulty people. It came to the generation of Israelites that God saved out of Egyptian slavery. And I love the language used here um, the Bible says that God took these people by the hand, which is a great reminder, please catch this, that salvation is not man reaching up, it is God reaching down. Salvation is not man reaching up, it is God reaching down. I'll try to illustrate. I've shared this story in the past. Um, years ago, I heard about a gathering of faith leaders. It was a collective of sorts. And there were different men on the panel representing different religions and belief systems and at one point, one of the guys spoke up and he said, you know, I, I feel like all of our belief systems are fundamentally the same. And he used an analogy. He said, just picture God on top of a mountain and there are all these different paths leading up to God and all of our different belief systems, they're just different paths. So it doesn't really matter which one you take as long as you're committed to that one, you can get to where God is. And so after he was done, um, the Christian leader raised his hand and he said, um, I disagree, beg to differ. That is not representative of what we believe as Christians, and this is where Christianity is fundamentally different. And then he took hold of the analogy, and he said, yes, we believe that God is on top of that mountain, but there are no paths that lead to him. And it doesn't matter what we do or how hard we try, we can't make our way to where God is, which is why God in his grace and kindness came off the mountain and came to us. Salvation is not man reaching up, it is God reaching down. I would also add and say, when God reaches, reaches down, he always takes the hands of willing participants. Like nobody comes after Jesus kicking and screaming. <laughs> when God reaches down to save someone, he finds someone that desires to go. This is what God has done for us. This is what God did for the Israelites. Took them by the hand, led them out of slavery, led them out of death, entered into a covenant relationship, yet instead of continuing on, they ran out the door and they started sleeping with other gods. And what was God's response? I'm gonna form a new covenant with you. And this covenant's gonna be new and it's gonna be better than the old. And we find the details of this in the next verses. Okay, go back to verse 10 with me. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Now, before addressing these better promises, I, I wanna take a moment to address the recipients of this covenant. Because the language that you see here in Hebrews 8, and again, all the way back in Jeremiah 31, it trips some people up at times. Because God says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay, this has led some people to believe and suggest that this covenant is only for ethnic Jews. Therefore, if you are not an ethnic Jew, this doesn't apply to you. These better promises aren't for you. And I would argue and say the problem I have with that is the Bible. Um, as Christians, we believe in something called progressive revelation. 
which means that we read and understand the Old Testament in light of what we see in the New Testament. We don't read and understand the New Testament in light of what we see in the Old Testament because in the New Testament, we have a fuller revelation. It has progressed. Here's what the New Testament teaches. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you now belong to the house of Israel. Let me give you a few examples. Okay, Romans 11. The Apostle Paul uses the analogy of an olive tree, and he's speaking here of the Jewish nation, ethnic Israelites. And he makes the point that as Gentile people, we're like a wild branch that has been grafted in. Okay, we didn't grow naturally out of the tree. But by faith, what God has done is he's taken us and he stuck us into the tree and now we're part of it. And because we're part of it, all the promises that God gave them, we now get to share in. We see the same reality in the book of Galatians at several points, but Galatians 3.29, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that if you know Jesus Christ, you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. What that means is that all the promises God gave to Abraham, if you belong to Christ, you now get to share in those. And then we see it very clearly in Ephesians 2, 11 verses, uh, verses 11 through 22. That in Jesus Christ, God has formed one new man. As Gentile people, we used to be strangers and we used to be aliens. But now because of Jesus Christ, God has brought us together, Jew and Gentile. He's formed one new man and we are fellow citizens with the household of God. Okay, why am I telling you all this? Because I, I want you to know these promises are for you. Like, I don't want anybody leaving today going, well, I'm, I'm not a Jewish person, and I know Christ, and I wish those promises were for me. And No, they are. If you know Christ, you get to share in these better promises. And so let me walk you through them. Number one, he promises a greater power. He promises a greater power. We see it in verse 10, I will put my laws into their minds and on their hearts. You see, under the old covenant, the law was entirely external. It existed out there somewhere on stone tablets uh, in accordance with Deuteronomy 6. People would write it on the doorposts of their homes. Uh, there were even people who would wear it on their person at times. There were these boxes called phylactery boxes, and they would actually write the law on little pieces of paper and put them in the boxes and wear them on their forearms or on their foreheads to remind themselves, oh yeah, need to follow the law. Here was the problem, though. Because the law was external, there was no internal power to obey. And the good news for us is that all this has now changed because of Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to read another New Covenant passage for you. It's found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. I'll just read a couple of verses. God says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, capital S, we're talking about the Holy Spirit here, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Okay, here's the deal. You belong to Christ, that's what he's done for you. He's taken your old, dead, cold, sinful heart, and he's ripped it out of you, performed a spiritual heart transplant, if you will, put a brand new heart inside of you, and on that heart is written the law of God. In addition, he's also sent the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, to indwell you, and he now gives you not only the desire to obey, but the power to obey. Okay, practically, this is why you intuitively know when something is wrong or sinful. Like James doesn't need to stand on the platform and tell you, you, you already know. And, and you can act like you don't know. Oh, I had no idea I wasn't supposed to be doing that, or I had no idea I was supposed to be. You know. Why am I so confident? Because the Spirit of God is in you. And the law of God has been written on your mind and on your heart. And so you can't excuse away, oh, I had no idea. The Holy Spirit of God ensures that you know so that you will obey. This is also why when you break the law of God, there's conviction. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul, he describes this ongoing war, this battle between your flesh and the Holy Spirit uh, the flesh is that part of you that is always drawing you away from God and toward sin, and the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's trying to draw you away from sin and toward God. And so has anybody ever felt a little schizophrenic or bipolar in your relationship with Jesus? Like, why in the world do I want to honor him and do that horribly sinful thing? Uh, welcome to Christianity, right? Because part of you is unredeemed, and part of you is redeemed, and so there's this constant war raging inside of you. Here's the point. When you break the law of God, you're opposing the spirit of God. 
When you break the law of God, you are running in the opposite direction of where the Spirit of God is trying to lead you. And so in those moments, what he'll do is he'll come after you and convict you, not to crush you, but to grow you more into the image and likeness of Christ. You now have a greater power in you. Number two, God promises a greater relationship. We see this again in verse 10. I will be their God, they will be my people. We see the same language used under the Old Covenant, Exodus 6, 7, um, there God is speaking of the nation of Israel. The problem was this, this language and this promise only applied to a small group of people from within the nation because the nation as a whole rebelled. The good news for us today, everyone who shares in the new covenant, this applies to. This applies. This is the relationship with him we enjoy. If you know Jesus Christ, please listen, God has given himself to you. And if you know Jesus Christ, God has taken you to himself. That sounds a whole lot like marriage, doesn't it? I mean, in marriage, what does a, a bride and groom do, a husband and wife do? They take each other to themselves and they give themselves to each other. At least in a healthy marriage, that's what they do. To love and to honor and to cherish and to bless. There's desire there, there's longing there, there's a healthy jealousy there, right? This is the relationship that God offers you in and through Christ. God gives himself to you, and he takes you to himself to love, to honor, to cherish, to bless. He desires you. He wants you. He's jealous for you, and this will be true for the rest of eternity. We see it in Revelation 21, verse 3. After Christ returns and he establishes the new heavens and the new earth, we're told there by the apostle John that the dwelling place of God will be with man, and they will be with him as his people, and he will be with them as their God. We enjoy a greater relationship under this new and better covenant. Number three, God promises a greater knowledge. He promises a greater knowledge. Because I've already pointed out and explained the old covenant was entered into by a nation. Uh, but the problem was there were people in that nation that would simply go through the motions or go through the rituals. Uh, yet they did not truly know God in a personal way. And the same thing still happens in churches like ours today. Um, you know, you got people who show up to church and they just kind of go through the motions and they do all the right things, probably for all the wrong reasons, but the reality is they don't know God. If that's you today, man, I pray that God would do a work in your life today, but the solution to that in ancient Israel was this, and this is what we see in verse 11. Neighbor would cry out to neighbor and brother would cry out to neighbor, know the Lord, know him. Don't just go through the motions and don't just do all the right religious things. You need to know him in a personal way. And this remains the evangelistic call for the world today. Right? This is the message we proclaim to people on the outside. We go to the nations, we proclaim the gospel, and we call lost men and women to know the Lord. But here's the reality. For those of us on the inside who already know him, we don't need anybody to remind us to know him. See, if you know him, there's this internal ache and longing in you to know him more. Like, I don't need to stand up here and go, know him. You're like, no, 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 I know him. And I want to know him more. It's like when you're in that dating relationship. Some of you, you got to remember back years and years and years to when you were in it. But you're in that dating relationship and you started getting to know that person. And you started to realize, oh, I kind of like them. And as you're knowing them, what did you want? I want to know him more. I just want to spend more time. I want to show up at the table. I want to do the dinner. I want to go out. I want to get on the phone. I just want to know more. Again, if you know Christ, this is the greater knowledge you now possess. It's why you're here right now. It's why you're sitting in the seat. At your, because, man, I just want to know him more. It's why you get the Bible and you read it. It's why you spend time in prayer. It's why you serve people. It's why you give your hard-earned money to the kingdom of God and, and to the cause of the gospel. I just want to know Jesus more. And I'm not talking about in an intellectual way. Like, oh, I want to know more about him. No, I'm talking about in an experiential type of way. I want to enter in and experience him in all of his fullness. And I want him to do things in me and for me and through me that only he can do. And then finally, number four, God promises a greater forgiveness. This is so good. Verse 12, I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. So good. See, under the old covenant, sin was never fully forgiven and it was never fully forgotten. You sinned, it was another sacrifice. I gotta do it again, I gotta kill someone again. That's um, so why the day of atonement rolled around every single year when the high priest would go back into the temple again 
make another sacrifice for the sins of the nation. It was just always present, never fully forgiven, temporary atonement. And because sin was never fully forgiven, it was never fully forgotten. (laughs) You were always mindful that sin was present. But now through Jesus Christ, God offers a greater forgiveness. See, when you know him, God forgives you fully, not partially. This is something that I missed as a church kid, okay? Uh, I came to Saving Faith in Christ at 14 years old, and I thought, okay, great. God now forgives me for 14 years of sinning. And now I gotta try hard to be a really good dude so that, right, God stays pleased and appeased. What I missed was the fact that, no, 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 God forgave all of my sin, past, present, and future. At 14 years old, when I put my faith in Christ, yes, he wiped the slate clean for those 14 years, but he also forgave the sin I would commit at 24 and 34 and 44 and 54 and on and on and on. He's forgiven sin I don't even know about. And he's done the same for you. But in addition, God forgets. And you go, well, how, how does that work? I thought God knew everything. How does God forget anything? He chooses to forget. He willingly chooses to remember our sins no more. This is the great promise of Psalm 103. I just wanna read this to you. He does not deal with us according to our sins. That's good news, isn't it? Nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. All right, let me ask you this. Um, do you have any idea what's going on on the West Coast right now? I know what was going on last night. There were a bunch of baseball fans in sackcloth and ashes <laughs> mourning the loss of their beloved Dodgers. <laughs> Go Braves, yeah. <laughs> World Series, baby, come on. Love it. But, but we have no idea what's happening now, right? Because here we are on the East Coast, and they're way over there on the left coast, the West Coast, and... And so when it comes to your sin, look, what God has basically done is he's carried all that over to L.A., dropped it. (laughs) And he's come back here to the great city of Atlanta, the land of blessing. (laughs) And he's rejoined all of us, and he's like, yeah, we're just, I'm done with that. I'm not going to remember that. I'm I'm, I'm just going to forget about all of that. Have you ever had someone just constantly throw your sin in your face? Ooh, do you remember when? Remember six months ago, remember two years ago? Marriage killer, friendship killer, relationship killer. As believers in Christ, we cannot get historical on each other. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Anytime you're getting historical and accusing someone else, you're doing Satan's work. You gotta stop that. God forgives and God forgets. Here's the deal. God will never throw your sin in your face because he willingly chooses to remember it No more. And so practically, let me say some things to you. Number one, this means that some of you need to stop holding your sin against you. Some of you have been living under guilt and shame for far too long now because of all that stuff back there that you've done. And here's what I want to say. God's not holding it against you. You don't need to hold it against you. Let it go. It's been forgiven. It's been forgotten. Secondly, I would say some of you need to stop trying to make up for your past sins. You ever done this? I have. Like, oh, man, I messed up royally. Okay, let me prove myself now. God, I'm going to make up for that. He doesn't need you doing that. And I just envisioned him from heaven going, you're trying to make up for what? Want to explain that to me? Oh, I forgot about that. I, I, don't, I don't even remember that. Like, that's done. That's dealt with. Stop trying to make up for it. And then I would also say that some of you need to stop holding the sins of other people against them. I had a conversation with a lady a couple weeks ago. We were talking about anger and bitterness and You know, I use the old adage, I'm sure you've heard it, that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Like, you can stay angry and you can stay bitter and it's not going to hurt them at all, but it's going to eat you alive. And at some point, in light of what God has done for you, you have to do the same for other people. As Christ's followers, we forgive because we've been forgiven. So the conclusion of all this, we find it in verse 13. I'm going to read this and make the point. We're going to pray, okay? And speaking of a new covenant... He makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Okay, here's the big idea of the entire passage and the entire message. You ready? The new is greater than the old. That's the simple point. The new is greater than the old. The word there, obsolete, means archaic. 
The old covenant is an artifact. The old covenant is a fossil. It is outdated. We do not need it anymore because we have something new and we have something better. The old covenant is kind of like a VCR. Anybody still use a VCR? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but anybody? <laughs> I think I have someone under a bed somewhere, but I can remember growing up. Listen, I can remember growing up. My mom was fully dedicated to our VCR. We had VHS tapes everywhere. And she would actually go to the store and buy blank VHS tapes and bring them home. Some of you, this is the house you grew up in. Um, some of you too young. You're like, I don't even know what a VCR is. So just Google it later, okay? But she'd bring home blank VHS tapes and we would record movies and shows on the VHS tapes. And then you have to write on the front so you remember what you recorded on that one and go back and find it and fast forward. It was so frustrating, right? Okay, here's a question. Why would I do that when I have a DVR? Why would I go over to Walmart today and buy a bunch of blank VHS to, and take it home and set the thing up and write on the front when I just can hit a button on my remote control and record whatever I want to record? Why do I want to fumble with tapes when I have Netflix? I just stream at Amazon Prime Video. I'll just, I'll just I'll watch whatever I want whenever I want. Again, here's the point. Why would I go back to the old when I have something new and better? We have Jesus. We have him. Why would we ever go back to trying to interact with God through laws and rules and sacrifices and imperfect people, like anchoring ourselves to buildings? Why? We have Christ, and his covenant is better, his promises are better, and God invites us in to take hold of those promises, and to enjoy them, and to live in light of them. And this is what I want to pray that God would help us to do today, is to live as new covenant People. And so across our locations right now, across our living rooms, I just want to invite, invite all of us just to bow in this moment. And I, I would say to you, believer in Christ, um, in a few moments we're going to sing and we're going to pray and we have communion elements available. If you want to partake of communion, if you brought a gift you want to make, financial gift, you can just drop it in any of the giving boxes over the next little bit. Um, but I, I would say, however the Lord's leading you to pray and respond now, and over the next few minutes, just do that. But for those of you, too, that showed up today, um, you've never given your life to Christ. You've never taken hold of this covenant, this, these better promises. I want to invite you to do it right now, just in faith. Just to admit your need for Jesus. Just tell him in faith, in prayer. Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I know I can't do all that work for me, but, but I believe you can. And just tell him what you believe. Jesus, I believe 2,000 years ago, you died my death in my place for my sins so that I could receive that greater forgiveness, enter into an eternal relationship with God, know him personally, <laughs> be loved by him, know him deeply, and then confess in faith right now what you know to be true of Jesus in this moment. Jesus, I believe that you're alive you're on the throne of heaven. You are king. You are Lord. You're the giver of new and eternal life. And just ask him to, to save you. Jesus, save me. I want to give my life to you today. I want you to be Lord and, and Savior. So with heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you're someone who made that decision for the very first time today, let me just encourage you before you leave, tell somebody what you just did. Um, our prayer team is gonna be at the front of the room. Our pastors will be at the front of the room. I'll be hanging at the front of the room. Just come and tell somebody, hey, I, I did that. I put my faith in Jesus today. We wanna pray with you, celebrate that, and give you some resources to really help you take some steps um, after you leave. But let me pray for us, and, and we're gonna respond. God, thank you for Jesus for all that we have in him. We thank you for these greater promises, these better promises. And God, I, I do pray that you would help us truly to enjoy them, to take hold of them, to live in light of them day in and day out. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for acceptance. Thank you for doing all the work on our behalf, God, so that we can be reconciled to you. So God, as we pray and as we sing and respond, we pray that you'd be glorified in this place. Come and work amongst us. Our, our lives are yours. This time is yours. Come, Holy Spirit, do a work.
pray it in Jesus' name.